Welcome to the London Free Press podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Gilbert. Well, he was a man of many names and many lives, and there are many people who have stories about their run-ins with him. He had an impressive network of high-profile friends and acquaintances, even co-hosting the largest ever live event on X, formerly Twitter, featuring Elon Musk and some other influential far-right figures before he was exposed. Today, I'm talking with London Free Press reporter Randy Richmond about his comprehensive feature on a con man from London named Darko Jovanovic. Hi, Randy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. This is a fascinating story. I, I want to say up front, we're, we're not going to be able to get into all of the details. So I encourage you to go to lfpress.com and read Randy's full feature because this story is wild. Um, so this man's name is Darko Jovanovic, but he had lots of aliases. So just tell us what what were some of his other names? What might other people know him as? Sure, sure. Uh, before I go on, though, I mean, Dale Crothers and I worked on this too. Dale was a, as our police reporter. So he and I worked together on this for about seven years now, off and on. Wow. Yeah, Darko Jovanovic, he's been kind of an obsession uh, uh, with us because he's so interesting and has created such a wide path across well now the world yeah darko jovanovich uh we knew him as ben barack a police officer knew him as aaron barack he's gone by um benjamin z or bz he's called himself chris he's called himself uh pablo he's called himself dr jovanovich right. he said he was the son of the fabric land chain owner he's also pretended he's at various times pretended to be two different lawyers um, who were using real names, but not the real lawyers uh, were involved. But yes, he's just a man of many names, many different uh, stories. Um, as he's kind of cut his paths, uh, starting in Windsor and all the way through to the internet. Yeah, all over the world. Yes. Um, as you said, you guys have, have written about him many times already. The first time was when he was pretending to be a doctor in Windsor. So what was his life at that point? What was what was the the con at that point? What was he doing? Well, he was he was kind of infiltrating different communities in Windsor, mainly as a Dr. Jovanovich. And he said he was a grandson of a, of a Dr. Jovanovich, who was a real doctor there, much beloved in the Italian community in Windsor. This uh, doctor was a selfless uh, person who would help everybody. So uh, Darko came along and said he was the grandson and he st started doing diagnoses on people. He had kind of a, in Windsor, kind of kind of a shotgun scattered approach. Wherever he met you, he would befriend you and might try to get some money or something else from you. Uh, in Windsor, the, kind of the, the worst thing he did was he convinced a family of a, of a girl that he was, we convinced everybody he was a doctor with privileges in Detroit. So right. he convinced his family that he'd gotten them an MRI in Detroit and was going to get them laser surgery for a brain lesion, which he diagnosed. Um, oh and with no not, medical training at all, right? no medical training at all. No. And uh, got a contract for 50, said, I've already paid for it. So uh, you owe me $58,000 and you can pay it over time um, and, and sign this contract and gave these people hope and try to take their money. He um, he got he bounced checks for furniture he bought from an exclusive furniture store after befriending the person there. To that mm -hmm. person, he spoke uh, Serbian. To the Italian community, he spoke Italian. He was a master of many languages, is a master of many languages. So he'd always infiltrate people, um, sort of talking to them in their own language or talking about his own life. And he kept, oh, in Windsor, he took money from a personal trainer. He took money from the furniture person. Um, there were a total of 17 people came to court to court with complaints to police with complaints right and some of those charges were dropped but he just um wherever he went he pretended to be dr jovanovich helpful dr jovanovich also that's where he said i'm the son of the owner of the fabric land chain uh in canada so that you know he used that to get money different from different alias different you know, different yeah life. well i think he was always dr jovanovich there but he happened to be the son he might you know he okay. might have other names there too but just all over windsor um different kinds of scams and cons he was attempting and it's so dangerous because he was actually diagnosing people giving i think the personal trainer that you mentioned he, he gave him pills at one point he was trying to give people hope and then in other cases he was 
telling people who were who were fine that they had dire um, medical issues, right? Oh yeah, uh, one woman uh, told media that she, you know, she was dying. He told her she has leukemia or something very wrong with her, and she shouldn't go on this trip. And she went on the trip anyways, and of course nothing happened because nothing was wrong with her. Oh. But she was worried the whole time because yes. the doctor, you know, the grandson of the famous doctor, told her that she was ill. So he just, you know, just kind of kind of wrecked lives all the way through Windsor. Yeah, so flippantly, right. Um, the stunt ended, this ended in a trial. He was eventually kind of caught and charged. Uh, how did that happen? What was he charged with? Well, he was eventually charged with uh, fraud and assault and um, possession of stolen property. A couple of people started getting suspicious. Uh, the personal trainer kind of figured out the guy wasn't, the, this doctor wasn't legit. Uh, another person uh, checked out the medical a real estate agent um, uh, who was showing him these expensive houses, um, tried to get him to sign this routine government form and he wouldn't do it. So the real estate agents looked at the medical registry, couldn't find him. Uh, the furniture salesperson's brother called police after the checks bounced for all this nice furniture. So eventually police caught on to him. He was arrested, charged, uh, uh, guilty of about i think it's uh several counts of, of fraud four counts of fraud two of assault and one of uh, possession and and convicted and then put on probation uh which didn't stop him from coming to london and no but did he, he did go to jail for a short time is that right he did go to jail for a short time yes that's okay. right Don't, only for a, few, a few months yeah it wasn't it wasn't very long because he time served and he had to pay back yeah. some so he was out on probation soon enough and ended up in London. Came to London, yeah. Um, I I, I want to get into, because a lot of your story centers around uh, his time with a police officer here in London, but you you did manage to talk to some former classmates because he is kind of from London. He grew up in London, and you did talk to some classmates from Rick Hansen Public School and St. Thomas Aquinas. He also uh, apparently went to a King's College at Western, uh, but he didn't graduate from there. Is that right? Correct, correct. Okay. King's College uh, said that he had registered but didn't graduate. Yeah, his his childhood friends, and they were close friends, um, mm -hmm. described him as this, you know, f uh, engaging person, but also with kind of a, a caustic side, uh, you know, critical of other people, very critical of his of his mom. Um, the dad didn't seem to be in the picture at all. And, you know, even one of his childhood friends said at one point, one night, he tried to convince her that his name was Pablo. Hmm. Uh, Pablo comes from, but it was like almost like a game at that point for him. Right. Uh, so much so that, that woman, when she was looking for him on Google years later, she actually was looking at Pablo to try to find him. Uh, I, you know, another friend talked about how he would go to the um, the former Galleria Mall and sit down and play the piano there. And people would be astounded at his prowess. You know, as a piano player, this this kid from high school would sit down and play, you know, a concert level uh, piano. So she talked about that. The other friend talked about how he loved the occult and they liked the Ouija boards. So, you know, he was kind of an outsider. Um, as one of the friends said, she was an outsider too. So he had that kind of a life, uh, lived with us in a small house in, I think, the South London, White Oaks area with his mom and grandma. And um kind of disappeared. And then years later, he told the high school friend that he was taking oncology at the University of Windsor. Um, and she thought, well, that makes sense. He's smart. And that's the last she heard from him until we contacted her. Sure. Um, you know, so there was some reason he went down to Windsor and who knows, maybe he took an oncology course. I, you know, We don't know. Maybe he did. Yeah. And then he got caught up in, in pretending to be the doctor. He does have a lot of talents, though, and, and you talk about this throughout your story, that he was very proficient in many languages, like fluently, uh, right. could speak a lot of them. And and the piano playing was uh, almost a way to charm people, it seems, because he was so good at, at, play, at playing piano. It was his key, a key uh, bit of truth that he used to convince people of other things. He would always um, use the piano for... Uh, the, one of the people in Windsor, uh, he would sit down and play the piano beautifully. Uh, at the gallery, he sat down and played the piano beautifully. Um, when Dale Crothers and I first met him, he told us stories about, about himself. And he said, I'm also a great piano player. And we said, well, everybody says that. And he sat down and he played beautifully. I, I'm no expert, but it sounded pretty good to me. It sounded right? great. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't plunking away. He was actually mm -hmm. playing the piano. So he, he used this wherever he went to kind of show, look, everything else I'm telling you is true because of this. 
mm. really effective way to convince people that the other things he was saying were the truth as well. Yeah. Um, what do we know about his background? Do we know much about his family? He said he was in White Oaks, lived with his mom and grandma. Dad wasn't well, around. Do we know much more? Not much. You can't really trust what he did say about his background. Mm. He told us, he told many people, including us, that uh, his mother was a, a survivor of the Holocaust. I didn't know any different until I went to court for one of the trials uh, involving uh, Darko Jovanovich and turned out his mom was born after the war. So definitely not a survivor of the Holocaust. Okay. Um, so she was in the picture. We met her. Um, that's all we knew. He said many things. He said he was a diamond importer. He said he was... Um, uh, ex-Israeli soldier, ex-Mossad. He said he was an engineer. Uh, when he was in London, he was an engineer working for General Dynamics. That was his main story okay. um, to some people. So, you know, what's true? What isn't? Who knows? I'm not even sure about all his languages. He said he spoke fluent Italian, but the Italian police officer that we um, got involved with, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, he said his Italian was not that great. So it's there's always kernels of truth Mm -hmm. that are exaggerated and built upon in his life. And so it's impossible almost to find out more. You could spend a couple of years digging and you find out a few things. In Windsor, they tried to find out. The court, his own defense lawyer, asked for some research on his client. Then they couldn't wow. find out much, yeah. And there isn't much online. And he, even uh, during that Windsor trial, he managed to never have his photo taken. Never. And he didn't manage. He, we couldn't get him in London. He never managed. He'd managed to avoid photographers in Windsor. And in London, um, all the way up until the very end. Um, now we had photos given to us eventually, but we we could never get one. Very covert, very covert. Um, a lot of your story centers around um, a two-year-long con uh, between Darko and a former London police officer, um, and that that's kind of the bulk of it because you did a lot of reporting on that at the time, and then again now. Um, just kind of tell us that, I mean, I know there's so many details, but the kind of the broad overview of what, how did that relationship start and how did it progress? Right. So it started very simply as his relationships do. Uh, the police officer, uh, former police officer, Achille Corrado, uh, was selling a car online. Uh, Darko showed up, said his name was Aaron Barak. They got to talking and then Aaron befriended him, um, the, the constable, uh, Corrado. He had some issues with the London police force. He didn't like the way some things were done. Um, they started talking. So um, I'll call him Darko, even though he called himself Barack at the time. Uh, Darko Jovanovich built on that, eventually leading to this uh, elaborate uh, con where um, Darko convinced uh, Constable Corrado that uh, these high profile London or Tr sorry, Toronto lawyers, uh, Juliana and Brian Greenspan, who are real people. Yes, um, yes he convinced well known people. Well known. And he convinced uh, Corrado that these liar lawyers and some high ranking officials in the OPP were conducting a province wide uh, probe on police corruption and ties to drug dealers. Uh, Darko set up this elaborate story that he was being pressured to help senior London police officers and senior business leaders in the city to import drugs across the border. And it became this elaborate scan. Now, the Greenspans were never involved. He used texts um, and some phone calls uh, with other people involved, and we don't know who they are, to convince Corrado that the Juliana Greenspan was a major person behind this. Um, the fake Greenspan was constantly texting um, Corrado. Of course, money became involved too. And so Crado was persuaded and convinced over two years to hand over, it turned out to be about over 400000 or $450,000 of his own to Darko Jovanovich uh, for his mom's medical bills or to keep him in the country or to help him with rent because, you know, um, Darko Jovanovich, as the fake Greenspans kept telling Crado, was the key to the corruption probe. So we had to keep him in the country. We had to keep him happy. We had to keep his mom happy and healthy. Right. We had to keep him healthy. Money just kept pouring in, pouring in, pouring in until one day uh, Darko screwed up and sent uh, used different number to send a text pretending to be Juliana Greenspan. Uh, Corrado found out it all fell apart. Right. Um, That's what tipped him off eventually. Yeah. So over this two years, Darko just, just preyed on uh, Corrado's 
uh, desire to try to clean up the London police force, as he believed. And also, um, Corrado says that, you know, Darko started to threaten him. And he's got texts from Darko threatening to kill him and his family. And again, here we come. I've, I'm former Mossad. I'm former Israeli soldier. I'm, right. Oh, don't tangle with me, right? Yeah, scary. Yeah. And, and and during this time, Corrado was giving him, like, some police information. Right. Yes. Yes. Not so, just money. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So he, that is so, whole, yeah, that so was the that, point of the, of the probe is that, uh, you know, Corrado would be handing over information to be key to the probe, including sure. uh, information about criminals who were who were charged. Uh, at one point, uh, the fake Greenspans and, Dar and Darko insisted that he try to get a person released from custody. Um, aside from money, where I'm not sure why uh, uh, Darko Jovanovich was was like what he was getting from the other end, from the criminals in London. Right. Um, as he's passing information to them, perhaps we don't know if he's getting paid by them or not. But he was pass he was taking information that uh, Constable Corrado could get from the police computer and sending it somewhere or just using it for himself. But sure. yeah, that's where Corrado got in deep trouble, obviously passing on confidential information. Corrado ended up going to a trial. He was convicted, uh, given house arrest. What what were his charges and, and conviction charges? He was such a cons uh, conspiracy, which was dropped, but um, breach of trust um, was the main one. Um, you know, he basically released confidential police information. Um, so he was, he fought that legally for uh, several years, they eventually lost and served 15 months of house arrest. Sure. Um, yeah. And somehow Jovanovich managed to never have to testify during Corrado's trial, even though this was really centered around him. Right. And How and did he, he get out of that? That's a very good question, uh, one that no one's ever been able to answer for us. The, you know, in the court, the uh, Crown said, well, we couldn't trust him anyways. Um, but he just seemed to disappear and no one seemed to care. And just before the trial began, he, uh, according to Corrado, he sent him uh, emails asking for more money in exchange for testifying and clearing Corrado's name. I've seen those emails. Um, they're quite the classic Darko Jovanovich. A little bit of humor, a little bit of threats, a little bit of promise. Um, in exchange for, I think it was like overall $2,500 to come and testify. Not a lot of money to come into court and testify. So he might've been in hard times then, but um, yeah, I mean, he, he just disappeared and nothing happened to him for that case. Uh, Constable Corrado, former Constable Corrado believes it's because um, he'd have to talk about this document that was alluded to called the manifesto, which was Constable Corrado's um, large, large report on um, allegations of corruption and uh, misconduct in the London police force. Hmm. So it was around this time that this trial was happening that you actually managed to meet with Darko himself as you and Dale Carruthers went to go and meet with him, uh, which surprises me that he would have even agreed to meet with two reporters, but but he did. So how did that go? How did you even <laughs> get him to agree to that? He wanted to talk. He reached out and wanted to talk to us that I'm the man in the middle. I'm the man with all the information. And we met him several times at his house, uh, his nice house where there was a baby grand piano, which he played for us and showed us his mom and his dogs. And he just talked and talked and talked and talked. He, the first time we spoke, we saw him, it was must've been an hour and a half, two hours of talking. And he described his version that he sold to us was, or tried to sell to us, was that this officer was making, made a half a million dollars by passing on information to criminals through Darko Jovanovich, the middleman. So Darko said, I made a lot of money, $300,000. Mm -hmm. um, this this uh, police officer made a lot of money selling the information to, to, and I, to the criminals. And I have all the information on it. I can prove it to all to you. And he showed us a little what he called proof, a couple texts. Um, he had some money bands. He's look, there used to be like, you know, thousands of dollars in these money bands. And 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 he said, and also this officer had created this manifesto, which would be the gold mine for reporters in London. Everything wrong with London police. You have to remember at the time there were about seven police officers in London being charged with various things. Mm. So the police were under a lot of spotlight then for, for criminal acts, and many of them were convicted. So, you know, the, the culture at the time was, yeah, there could be this document. So Darko Jovanovich held this out to two reporters. Here it is, he's dangling in front of us. I've got this manifesto. I've got all these texts. You know, in exchange, 
if you tell my story, you'll, you'll protect me. That's what he thought we could do for him at first. That's all he wanted was tell the story. He, doctor said, just tell the story and I'll be protected. You're my protection. So that was kind of what he was promising. Now he kept promising to show us more proof and kept promising to get us the manifesto. And as time went on weeks and turned into months, he kept coming up with an excuse not to show us the text or the manifesto. Um, you know, kept promising, kept promising. And then for us to turn, I mean, we knew we didn't think anything big was going to happen necessarily, but for us, the turning uh, point came when he tried to sell us some diamonds because he couldn't sell diamonds anymore. And, you know, we're journalists. We don't have money for diamonds, right? Just casually buying. I think it was like $50,000 worth of diamonds. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's which I didn't have in my pocket. You at the guys time. are big spenders. Yeah. Yes. And there was no budget for the free press to spend money on diamonds. No, no. <laughs> so we were laughing at that, that you would think reporters would have that money or would, would fall for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a little more digging. We found out his name was Darko Jovanovich. We confronted him with it and he just cut us off um, at that point. And we knew that our relationship was over. And what name was he using with you when you first got a hold of him? Ben Barak. Okay. And that and was, was the using... name he was using with Corrado so that it, no. it all matched up? No, he was, he was using Ben Barak with us and Aaron Barak with Corrado. Okay. So okay. at least he kept the same last name throughout sure. the time in London. And, and then wh at what point did you find his real name? Like when did you realize what, it, what his real name was? After, soon after he stopped communicating with us, uh, we found out, I'm not even sure how I remember how we found out anymore, but we found out his real name somehow. I think it was on some sort of court documents or something that we were digging into. And then we found the Windsor stories and then we confronted him by text and he got mad and he yelled at us, me especially. It was kind of a, there was a good cop, bad cop going thing going on. I was a nice cop and Dale Crothers was the bad. No, so I'm sorry, the other way around. There's a good cop, bad cop thing going on. I was a bad cop and Dale Crothers was a nice cop. And mm -hmm. He would yell at me and plead with Dale to yell at me. And it was just, it became quite amusing. And we didn't know what to do with this information of the story we had um, at that point. Crotto was still going through all the court. So we thought we have to wait until all of that went through, sure. which took up until last December before that court court proceedings were done. Okay. Okay. Um, after, after that, uh, and then you met with him and after the Corrado case, he, he kind of went away. Uh, actually, no, he didn't go away. He was getting into petty crime. Is that right? So after, yeah. after this big long con, then he was just getting into small, small little things. Yeah. It was a, quite a bit of a downfall for his, from, you know, he, he conned people in Windsor out of several thousands of dollars or several hundred went to London and got $450,000. And all of a sudden, you know, things were going downhill for him. We lost touch with him, um, couldn't find out where he was. Uh, and then he showed up on court dockets for stealing. He was stealing uh, gas, um, charged with stealing gas, with uh, um, possessing other people's licenses, driving without insurance, driving with uh, improper insurance, things like that, a lot of petty crime. Um, so yeah, so we saw him in court again. Well, actually we saw him... Um, we went to his court appearance, of course, it was all of a sudden Darko Jovanovich, but his real name is back in London. Turns yeah. out he's been charged in other places too, uh, Quebec and Ottawa. Okay. Nobody will admit to who, nobody will say who picked him up. Um, the London police said that wasn't them. Uh, border services wouldn't tell us. We had no idea where he was, but he ends up all of a sudden on the screen from Elga Middlesex Detention Center uh, via video in court. And of course, he sees us in court and being dark, he starts waving and smiling at us. And wow. He's just such a, a character. We met him outside of court after he was done. He looked rough. Uh, his lawyer said he was uh, struggling with addiction, um, which would explain the petty crime. So, uh, you know, that was kind of the end of his London appearance was, you know, as a petty crook. Um, mm -hmm. he, was he you know, in jail long for that? He wasn't in jail long. No, I don't think so. He was um, in jail waiting trial. Uh, and then the sentence wasn't much and he was out. He was out soon. And uh, I mean, they weren't, they weren't violent crimes or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, but again, he it was disappeared really, after that. He did disappear after that totally off our radars for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, until and then it resurfaced online. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Talk about that. <laughs> well, we got texts in, um, in December, uh, Dale and I, uh, from someone uh, on Twitter or X um, 
talking about this person. So what happened is that I, a, a couple of years ago, he he reappeared online on Twitter, X space or X, we'll call it X now, on X spaces, which are these sort of um, hosting platforms and you know communication platforms to discuss issues of the day. And he was presenting himself um, as a lawyer and a former um, Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Justice official, commenting on the Ukraine-Russia war. I know. <laughs> so, it's, a, it's a new story every time he appears, it is. right? Yeah. And apparently, uh, since he left London, he also got married and had three children living in Ottawa with him. So, oh, okay. Yeah, he's been busy. And is that true? Does he have a family? I, I don't know. I okay. would have my doubts. Okay. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, so he um, he shows up, and then when the uh, of, of the uh, you know the Hamas invading uh, uh, Israel on October seventh, so he all of a sudden became a well known expert on uh, Middle Eastern issues, and he's a very engaging, intelligent person. And so on these spaces, he was on X spaces. He was uh, sometimes a host, sometimes would talk, and he was very reasonable, moderate, apparently. Um, you know, not the kind of stuff we see on X and social mm -hmm. media where people can be unhinged. So he got a following. And, um, you know, I don't even understand the X spaces a whole lot because I'm not on there on the shows, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he built up quite a following. Um, his name was Benjamin Zev or uh, just BZ on, on, on X for short. Sure. And he got so well known and so in grained in that community they ended up hosting um the biggest as you say x space uh, event uh co-hosted with elon musk you know the the owner of the whole media right. um yeah, and so uh but what he'd done is he put a photograph of himself finally he did it himself after a decade or so of not having a picture taken he posted a picture of himself for x space um and Somebody got a bit suspicious and did a did a, a, a Google search of that, somehow came across the name and it started to unfold very quickly. The uh the people on X contacted uh us. Dale got back to them and did a great story in December or the January about how this had all fallen apart for him mm -hmm. or was falling apart for him. Uh, you know, got on some of these events himself with former uh, Constable Corrado to talk about what Jovanovich had done and it all fell apart. Now there's still, because it is X, there's still people out there who believe him and people can't believe us. And, you sure. know, there's people out there who, some people are saying this person is it and this person is it and it's not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he could be back for all we know. Hey, um, so, do we know where he is now? Like where is, because he kind of left social media for a while. He wasn't, it at least wasn't using that same name. Right, right. I no, we don't know. I mean, I believe we believe he's in Ottawa. Still, he does live in Ottawa. We think. Okay. Um, I think he had connections there from the past. So, but yeah, where he's doing, what he's doing, um, we don't know. Uh, we've been in contact with him. Uh, not me, because I'm the bad guy. Uh, since but, when? Since the interview that you had done with him in London. Oh yes, since since the X space stuff broke. Okay. Uh, Dale Crothers has been in contact with with Darko um, to get comments. Uh, for the story and he's declined to comment okay on any of the allegations now i know i i know that we've kind of been um laughing a little bit during this during this interview only because of the absurdity of some of these stories that he's told but he has have le has left so many victims in his wake um have any of them or any in any of your reporting have you come across any reasons why he does this kind of thing is there any speculation as to What's he trying to get from people other than maybe some some money? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Corrado, who probably lost the most, he lost a career mm -hmm. as a police officer in $450,000, uh, had to remortgage his house. I think he lost his house credit line. He's, you know, he had to uh, resign earlier than he wanted to. I mean, he was going to be forced out of his job, but he resigned to use his pension to pay for legal bills. He thinks it's not just about the money. It's that for him. Uh, he thinks Darko does it for the money and the thrill. He likes to be in control and power. He likes to be more intelligent than you and me. Like he, he wants to be held up that way. He wants to know he's fooling people. Um, that's Karada's point of view. And I've talked to some of the people in Windsor and they had a similar point of view mm -hmm. that he was just this person who just 
always had to pretend and fool. Um, where does that come from? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And you know, you know, the at the end of our our story, we talk about to someone who said, and that's a great quote, a great, and I'll paraphrase it, but basically Darko Jovanovich could have been any of these things he faked. He could have been a doctor. He could have been an engineer. He was, he's an intelligent man. Mm. He could have been a lot of things, but he instead chose to pretend to be these things and it all fell apart for him. And so where does that come from? I, I don't know. Yeah. He's out. He's not in jail. Um, we, we don't know exactly where he is, but I mean, there could be more to this story. Do you think? Will you be following this? I'm sure he'll jump on anything that, that appears. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. for now, I mean, it's just kind of left hanging there. It is. I mean, the, the uh, Constable Grotto's uh, um, legal appeals are done. Um, the, you know, Dark has been exposed and his pictures everywhere now. And we've got a lot. And uh, our stories shows Darko in his many, many, many faces. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, you know, we're hoping, you know, that we want to get him out there so other people don't get uh, victimized by him. I mean, yeah. um, the people in Windsor and, you know, they must be a little upset that he's still conning people. I mean, I know that uh, Principal Corrado has said, you know, if, if the police had charged him here and his picture been all over the papers, maybe this stuff on X wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it is an entertaining story in some ways. You're right on the surface. Fascinating, but yeah, yeah. 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 That's a better word for it. Um, but below the surface, there's a lot of people who are hurt mm -hmm. and a lot of people who, you know, as you say, left some wreckage. And so we just want to get that out there too. We want people to know who this is. Mm -hmm. uh, if he tries to fool people again, maybe, you know, maybe our story and our coverage will, will help prevent that. Sure. Prevent, prevent more victims, hopefully. Well, Randy, this, this story, honestly, it sent me down a Google rabbit hole once I read it. So I encourage you to go to lfpress.com and, and read the story, uh, the feature about Darko Jovanovich. Thank you, Randy, for joining us today. I have a feeling that you and I may be discussing this at, at some other time, but but we'll see. And in, in the meantime, we'll we'll delve into this feature. Thank you so much.